Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in to PWD Allies Podcast. The show is being broadcasted from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Beautiful BC, Victoria. And uh, if you've never been to Victoria, check it out sometime on your travels. Uh, please uh, you know, tune in to your favorite podcast where you find it best suited for you. There's lots of variety to choose from. Today, I have a very special guest. Benita MP Benita Zarello from Port Moody, Coquitlam. I got it right this time, Benita. I pronounced it uh, as you say, uh, Port Moody, uh, uh, Port Moody, and uh, Coquitlam. And uh, but I got it right. So thank you very much for tuning in today, and thanks for coming on as my guest. Well, thank you so much for the invitation again. It's good to be back. I'm here on the unceded and traditional territory of the Kwikwetlam and the shared territories of the Coast Salish. And I'll hope to take you up on your offer to come over to Victoria at some point. And yeah. just, just, before we, just before we get going, Brent, we, we wanted to say as well that it's a pre-recorded episode. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to be releasing this uh, episode later at uh, 2 p.m. Pacific. 5 p.m. Eastern, and so the chat at that time will be live, but this is not a live episode. This is mm -hmm. recorded, yeah. Yeah, you can tune into the live chat later today, uh, and you uh, won't be interacting with the, our guests today, uh, but you'll be interacting with each other and yeah. uh, and, and a con commenting on what you... Uh, what it's, you like, uh, it's like a watch party, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's actually quite neat, actually, how it's broadcast yeah. that way. Yeah, so, Benita... Um, I guess we'll get started on uh, the, the big topic of the CDB. Uh, where where does the CDB stand right now uh, for Canadians with disabilities across Canada? Um, I know that a lot of uh, discussions have been happening on uh, on Twitter sphere, um, the social media on Twitter, as people would know it now. It's called X. I still call it Twitter because that's what I know it as. And, um, a lot of people are in the disability community are seeing it as um, maximum $200 uh, per month when it does come to fruition. Um, now, you know, it's just, I guess a lot of the, uh, you know, people were really upset uh, from what I'm seeing, all the comments out there. And um, they're wondering why it was only $200 up to, I guess, up. I should say the keyword up to $200. And then there's the DTC as a stumbling block to make them qualify for that. Yes. Well, they absolutely are within their right for sure to be angry about this and to be really disappointed. There yeah. was so much um there was so much trust that was extended to the Liberal government on this. There was so much momentum behind them. The the disability community really opened their their hearts and shared so much consultation and the Liberal government decided that this is the way they were going to move forward with, with as you said, the smallest amount uh, really they could, which was the $200 up to, you stated it, Brent, maximum $200 mm -hmm. a month, and uh, hidden behind this DTC, which everyone told them shouldn't be. So there's a lot of work to do to move ahead. We, we It is in law. It is uh, required. The government is required uh, to be paying this out. Uh, so this is definitely a, a path for a move forward, but there's still so much work to do and such so much recovery that this liberal government needs to do to bring trust back. I mean, they said now they want to reopen a whole new consultation process. Totally unacceptable. Yeah. Well, especially when they first started out with the announcement came out back in, geez, well, years ago now, like back in 2020. And, uh, you know, the announcement that we'd watch it in the news every morning, you know, the Justin Trudeau would come on on your morning news hour and uh, all these announcements, but then Canadians with Disabilities was the last segment of population to get an announcement. And you're always just uh, dragging the heels and it delays, delays, and uh, then they call it a, a snap election. Uh, and then of course, then the bill got, uh, you know, defeated, just kind of washed right out and then redone again. It's kind of like regurgitated, I called it, you know, and thrown back out there with the same concept, but, it was supposed to be over a million people, and then it went down to six hundred thousand, and now down to maybe twenty five thousand at the most. Uh, and it's like a gut punch, uh, you know, to the disability community. And I guess too is um, a lot of the chatter was saying that, uh, well, I mean, and and, and nothing is toward you at all, Benita, but it was saying that the NDP had had voted for the two hundred dollars uh, up to two hundred dollars. I was wondering if you could maybe 
maybe explain to the disability community on that. Um, you know, what, what, what happened or like what's going on with that? Yeah, for sure. And I think that, you know, yeah. it was a real disappointment. It really was. Like you said, a gut punch when that news came out that that was the amount of the benefit. And for sure, it's inconsistent with all of the Canadian commitments, whether they're international commitments on uh, rights to uh, adequate standard of living, whether it's our even our constitutional rights to equal access to public services, which we know income support is an essential public service that they have an adequate, uh, they have a right to an adequate. So I, I know that the fact that the amount is so low is so disappointing and for sure the it's not something that the NDP supports in any way the problem is the government rolls it in like they do with many programs that they don't you know they don't want to call out they roll it in with this this budget this budget bill and we know right now that there were many other things in that budget bill specifically housing that was very important the largest investment in co-op housing in decades uh, was in that bill and the opportunity and then obviously the pharmacare and the dental care was also in that bill so it became a very difficult um it became a very difficult position, but at the end mm -hmm. of the day, we're moving forward with all kinds of services that Canadians need, and we are not giving up this fight. Um, we have the, the budget bill coming up again. Uh, as NDPers, we are saying this $200 is totally not acceptable. Uh, we want to see it much higher, at least four times higher. We want to see it, and this disability tax credit needs to be removed. I know that the government's trying to say that it's the only equal level measure across all of Canada. This just isn't true. Yeah. It's a medical decision whether someone gets a disability tax credit or not. And we know that those very, I know two sisters both have MS. One got the tax credit from their a medical professional, one did not. Their, their argument that it's equal is just, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't hold water. Well, well we can okay. talk about, because last time you were here, we wanted to talk about the dental, actually, uh, the NDP's dental uh, plan. And, and I just heard the other day that the DTC was going to be a prerequisite for that too. So, so, oh. but we, we could talk up we could talk about that later if you, if you want. I just wanted as, as well, though, to, to talk about, I mean, um, you know, I think the last time you were on, and I meant this. I meant this as a total compliment to him. I don't. I, I said that you and both you and uh, Mike Morris are, were the two-headed monsters, uh, yeah. in the sense that you're 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 the only two that consistently stand up and and fight for and fight for the Canada Disability Benefit like more than anybody else. It's mm -hmm. it's it's you and you and uh, Mike Morris that are, are taking all the slings and arrows. And, uh, you know, whenever you put yourself out there as an, as a PWD advocate, like both uh, Brent and I can speak to that. I'm not on, on Twitter anymore, but Brent is, and he probably takes a little bit more slings and arrows than I do, but we know that we can see that you and both you and, um, uh, Mike Morris are taking a, a fair bit of slings and arrows, like I said, and I, I just didn't know if you wanted to speak on that, like, uh, when when the NDP, for example, uh, okayed the two hundred dollars, was it because part part re, part part of the reason was because you were worried about a triggered election, or or was that part of the decision, or what? So thanks for bringing that uh, back around, Neil. And for so I, I'll start by saying that it's good to have more than you know to have multiple voices in the house of commons and i'm surprised how little we hear from the conservatives the mm -hmm. official opposition yeah the official opposition it, it should have stood up on mm -hmm. this and we did not hear from the official opposition and let's talk about the block too i mean the block yep. as well they're you know they have a they have their own universal basic income program that's running right now so, you know, maybe it wasn't as uh, relevant or as important to Quebecers, but certainly Canada-wide, where's the opposition? Where is the Conservatives on this really disappointing? And I would say that just in, in regards to the budget, right, is that the, the Conservatives not only walked away from this, they walked away from starting the journey for persons with disabilities. They walked away from the housing investments. They walked away from the dental and the pharmacare. I'm sure many of you hear from... 
folks that are desperately in need of expansion on that pharmacare. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, that on the larger picture, we're, we need to fix the social safety net that's been eroded decade after decade after decade. And, and Neil, we'll go back to the, the dental, but I just want to talk a little bit about housing. Look where we are on the housing front after 40 it's, years it's of bad. no social oh, it's terrible. Yeah. Oh, terrible. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a state of emergency. And I know that uh, a lot of, um, you know, critics will call it a, a crisis. I call it a state of emergency um, because... It, it shouldn't be in this. They, they we should not be in a housing, um, you know, emergency or say you know crisis or anything. I mean, that housing should be built for people to have for homes. Like people are living in tents. I mean, because they can't afford the high market rent. Our last it's- podcast was was about housing, and I, I hope people share that out because it was a really good. Ep- it was a super extended episode, but it was I I, I really liked that episode that we did the last uh- week. Absolutely. And, you know, a absolute state of emergency. I had a, a mother in my office last week, her, second time she's come to see me about her son, adult son who works full time with a developmental disability that's displaced due to demo eviction and they were paying 800. They oh, wow. found they found a basement suite, but they're paying 1600 now for that basement suite. Oh, they wow. don't read or write, which they told the landlord that but the landlord said that's fine, just sign here, here and here. Now the person is on the hook for all of the utilities for the entire house. So I'm working now to try to, you know, to try to help navigate through that. But I mean, just the, the, the disadvantage of persons with disabilities already. And, and then just the absolute abuse of corporate landlords to, Mm -hmm. to take advantage of, of, of the market right now and to demo vict people knowing they have nowhere to go and then taking advantage of them by upping their, their rents, doubling their rents. It's, it's despicable. So I, yeah. very, well, very even, sad. Even my landlord, um, you know, basically admits that rents will go as sky high, as sky as whatever the market will bear. And I, I was shocked to hear that. But at the same time, I don't want to call them out because I don't want to lose my place, right? So um, I was livid when I heard that too, because um, people's incomes don't go sky high. Sky is the limit. I mean, people only have so much to budget in per month for rent and uh it comes a point where how high is rent going to go where people can't afford to live i mean in the place that they want to be in that's right well, and look, sorry go ahead neil i was just i was gonna ask for your opinion on like i'm sure you're following uh david eb's uh bc builds and uh, there there was an article in, in the newspaper a couple of days ago and, and that's why we did that's why we did the podcast because uh, one of the examples that, that was given was uh, there was some money paid out to a, uh, or it was a loan by by the BC government to to do this, um, you know, affordable housing uh, in kits, and <laughs> the uh, the affordable housing of uh, for a two bedroom, like if you if you were like a married couple with a kid or two, you would need to have a two bedroom. And so the the two bedroom example that there was, that there was was it was seven hundred square feet, mm-hmm. and and according to uh, BC Housing's own numbers, you would need to be able you would need to have a take home pay of one hundred ninety three thousand dollars in order mm-hmm. to afford this two bedroom uh, place. Now, right. um, you know, I don't know how many uh, families. Average families can afford one hundred ninety-three thousand uh, dollars. When uh, we 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 went, we threw out some numbers, and and the average income for most uh, most uh, family incomes is around the I think it's one hundred eight thousand before taxes. So I just wanted to get your feedback if you've been following that, and, and I think it's just kind of crazy the math that goes into all that. I certainly have been following it, and you and you point out exactly why tying things to the market is not the is is not yes. the way to go to tie affordable housing to the market. So I'm just going to talk about my colleague uh, MP Jenny Kwan out in Vancouver East. She identified this very very early that this idea of affordable being, you know, eighty percent of market still mm-hmm. wasn't affordable. So that's another thing that the NDP worked on federally was a new definition. Mm. of what's affordable because that 80% mark is it's not like 80% of $2,700 is still 
not affordable. So uh, definitely that, that definition needs to be redefined. We're leading in that work in the NDP. But you mentioned something else I just wanted to touch on, and that was, you know, uh, married couples or common law couples and how the, I want to talk a little bit about how disability payments and even the Canada disability benefit will be potentially at risk if people decide that they'd like to marry or cohabitate together. Mm-hmm. And I just, I'm interested in, in what you hear from, uh, from residents about this, because certainly um, NDP, we don't want any clawbacks. We don't think people should be punished to have a lifelong partner or to share in, in household costs. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on that, because I think yeah. there's room for us to do more work there. Yeah, I, I can comment on that. Um, recently, I, I decided to phone up BC Housing because I was curious to find out um, about their housing lists. Um, and I was told that there's at least, uh, I mean, 20 year waiting list right now. Like there's such a demand for housing, but they're going to take um, families with children first. And, and, you know, and I understand that. I mean, they want to get families, you know, with their children in. I said, okay, but what about if, People that are, say, say two PWD that live in market housing and they want to have cheaper housing. Um, okay. He says, well, I'm not sure what you're asking. I said, well, to get into BC housing. And he goes, well, you have to go on a waiting list. You need to have your building either sold, condemned, it's unhabitable, uh, or you're fleeing violence. Um, there's so many topics in order to get on that list. And I, that I said, that doesn't make any sense. That makes no sense. I mean, uh, cannot two PWD move in there? Well, you can, but you would have to be in a relationship. I go, okay, but what if you're not in a relationship? What if you just know the other person? Or maybe you have a neighbor who said they, um, you know, they can't afford the high market rent. So you want to move in with your neighbor or your two neighbors. Same thing. Well, as long as they're basically in one, in one dwelling, they're actually classified as in a relationship. Uh, and you're now going to get one check uh, instead of two checks under one file. Um, and I said, so you're basically saying there's no guarantee. And the individual told me that, well, why do you keep saying no guarantee, Brett? Uh, the, that word's not in the vocabulary. It's guidelines that you need to follow the guidelines under BC housing. It's a policy. So what's what I'm basically the moral of the story is I think it's the regulations that are in there that are so much red tape that's involved. Yeah. If they cut all that red tape out of there and this, let people move into there and have the income based on the individual, not household, because that's where the other problem too is all based on household income, and it but, will actually hurt the person. You know, and, of- and that and that's that's half of the problem. But the other half of the problem is that the the rates need to be increased too, because right. this is what this is what I always say is that the fact of the matter is is that the the vast majority of people on PWD here here in BC. Let's just focus on BC for a moment. Um, the vast majority are paying market uh, market rents. It's mm-hmm. they there's only about I always say maybe about twelve percent that that uh, that BC Housing is is probably only providing about twelve percent of their housing to uh, PWD clients. So so you have twelve percent versus you know eighty eight to ninety percent are actually paying uh, the market rents. So I mean I mean how is that fair? How can you say that? only providing 12% of affordable housing to uh, PWD clients is is fair math. It's not. It's pink unicorn math, like I always say, right? Well, yeah, on average, I mean, in Victoria, I'll just, I'll just pick Victoria as an example because that's where I live. But on average, a one-bedroom in Victoria right now, on an average, it's about $2,100. A PWD full check is fourteen eighty three fifty. I mean, you couldn't even, that's just, you couldn't even rent a place, not even pay for your hydro or food or, you know, your, your amenities, anything. Um, So we got a serious issue happening there with the housing and a long waiting list to get into housing, uh, into BC housing, if that's where a person wanted to move to. Um, For me, uh, I think autonomy wise, I mean, a person should be able to live in the sector of housing where they want, but have enough resources to cover uh, their basic needs. And when those basic needs are not being met, there's a serious problem, a flaw in the system. I guess another thing I wanted to quickly mention to you, uh, Benita, was your thoughts about, okay, so you got all the provincial governments, well, not all of them, but there's a lot of them that have the P, uh, PWD uh, designation for persons with disabilities in their province. There's prob- some provinces, unfortunately, that don't have that, but there's a lot that do. Uh, what is your view about 
a PWD, say living in British Columbia, and they wanted to move to, oh, I don't know, Manitoba, um, and not having to reapply for this status to say that they're still disabled under another province. Yeah, well, this this goes to, back to the constitutional right, right, for adequate standard of living and then the same essential public services for all. And that doesn't exist right now. And mm. what I'm really concerned about, well, the the medicalization they continue the federal government continues to to see this as a medicalization they want this disability tax credit disability tax credit which is a medical uh sign off which is wrong this is wrong and mm -hmm. it needs to end and it needs to be adequate adequate uh, income for all canadians same level of public essential public services for all canadians where wherever they live and it's not going to come through a disability tax credit it's going yeah. to come through them acknowledging that province by province, if someone has uh, access to those support systems, that they should have them wherever they want to go. Territory, province, shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. Now, we, sorry, Brent, uh, we do want to respect your time and we're, we know we're getting to the close uh, close to the end here, but I did want to touch on, if you have time, touch on the um, the, the dental. dental. You bet. Because, you because bet. I know, yeah. I know we, you wanted to do that last time. We ran out of time. And like I said, at the top of the show, I had just heard just the other, just yesterday that that the rumor is that they're going to tie the DTC to the, to the dental. So I, I I wanted to see if you, if you want hmm. to speak on that or if that's topic, if that's yeah. accurate or not. It is accurate, and that's the way that it's been uh, laid out in the legislation: is that it is a disability tax certificate, tax credit certificate, to get access to the dental. This is something uh, Minister Qualtra and I talked about two and a half years ago, right at the very beginning, mm -hmm. when we were talking about the Canada Disability Benefit. Uh, I said to the minister and the minister was uh, on board with this is that you know it can't be the DTC as the qualified or the CDB and we said mm -hmm. we're going to need to solve this before the dental rolls out because the dental is going to you know fall within the same category where you're going to need this disability tax credit now mm -hmm. this is the way that the government has decided to move forward I think they've done this for speed more than um uh, more than anything else. They just feel that this is the quickest way for them to be able to roll out these. So what I would say to your listeners today and um, is that please go and get the disability tax credit if you can. There is funding. The federal government has put aside budgeted, budgeted money for folks to be able to go and get a disability tax credit. I would encourage many, many folks that I talk to say, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to jump through those hoops. I don't want to do it. I absolutely understand that this is a burdensome, burdensome process. You shouldn't have to do it at this point in time. It is the only way to get access into the Canada Disability Benefit and the dental for persons with disabilities. Now, the good news on the dental is next year it will roll out for all Canadians, so it won't be necessity. But I do know that right now there is that barrier. It's, it's really unfortunate, but I would encourage everyone who can to go out and get that disability tax credit. Hmm. Yeah, well, th well, thanks on that, uh, Benita, for that update. Um, because, yeah, it's so important to, um, you know, get the message out there to let, uh, you know, Canadians know what's going on with that. Uh, uh, definitely, what was it? Uh, will I, well, will I, well, I had a message for you, Benita. Will it get clawed back from BC? Sonia had a yeah. message for, for me to give to you. I was just like, what are you writing down here for me? <laughs> yeah, so will it get clawed off of BC? And that's the cat, uh, the disability benefit she's asking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. So I know that uh, when the minister, the BC minister uh, Sheila Malcolmson, uh, was asked that question, she 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 answered it in a, in a roundabout way. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm quite confident that it won't get clawed back. I, I think that you know the way that she answered it was uh, was maybe just not as uh, direct as it could be. But I mean, we've got commitment already from Manitoba. I'm quite sure after this election in BC, we'll have this commitment from BC. They did not roll back the SERB payments in BC, the only province who didn't. 
So mm -hmm. I know I know that the NDP government in BC understands the the cost of living crisis that is happening here, and, and I can't see it happening. But I can tell you that on the federal level, the federal NDP will continue to fight for that. I do have a motion on the floor about clawbacks, and I am working right now on advancing another one that has to do with cohabitation and clawbacks. So we will continue to work on that. Wonderful, yes, wonderful on that. Um, just an update for you. There was a petition that um, I had uh, gen got generated out there, uh, petition E5047. It has now reached over 500 signatures. Yeah, so so, so, so we're, we're going to have it spoken to uh, in the House. So that's, that's perfect. Cool. Yeah. That's yeah. perfect. And the more times that uh, MPs can stand up and raise this in the, in the House, uh, the better. It's, it, it seems quite incredible that we would be in 2024 and still yeah. not have an adequate income for persons with disabilities after all of our international commitments, our national commitments. And I would say we can't let the provinces and territories off the hook. The provinces and territories need to pick it up and step up and make sure that everyone in this country that has a disability has it, uh, access to an adequate income. Yeah. That's exactly the way I look at it. I mean, there should be no less, uh, like uh, Jeff like it always says, no less than poverty level, like it, uh, financial support. It should be no less than the, um, I always say the LICO formula is, is better. <laughs> That's what I like. Uh, but the federal government likes to use the MBM, right? Um but I mean, regardless, it's like around twenty two, twenty three hundred dollars a month just as a base standard. I mean, that's for people who don't have any disabilities. I mean, when you have disabilities, there's all the all the extra additional costs, yeah. that, you know, basically above that. But at least if we get a standard floor that we can build on and tie it to inflation, the cost of living, COLA, um, that way we can build from that point on. But when uh, basically governments uh, kind of haggle back and forth. Nothing gets done. Um, there's always that you know excuse of the liberal government saying, "Well, there's more to do. Uh, we hear you. Well, put the those words into action. Let's let's put it into action. Let's actually make reality uh, for a better way of life for Canadians across Absolutely. our country. I mean, as Agreed. we get older, we get more disabilities. Uh, they don't go away. Yeah, you know? and so we we need to protect our society and provide a, a base floor. Uh, Absolute, so absolutely, absolutely agree. And they need to get their priorities straight. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of a lot of subsidies are still going to oil and gas. They're investing yeah. heavily in in, in other uh, resource extraction right now. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. as you've all said, like there's there there is a state of emergency in housing in this, this country, right across this country. And if and if the government, you know, the Liberal government can't get the foundation right, we know the Conservative government can't get their, the the foundation right. We need to have you know we we need to have way more pressure happening from uh, from folks like you and those petitions that you're doing to ha make them understand. And hopefully, well, I mean, obviously, as an NDP, -er, I'd like to yeah, see we, the NDP in government. Like, uh, we really appreciate your advocacy as well. And that's what, one thing I wanted to really stress as well. So, yeah. Definitely. I really appreciate all your advocacy work that you're doing, uh, Benita, for standing up for Canadians with disabilities and, uh, and you know, and low-income people, seniors. Uh, I mean... <laughs> It doesn't matter what age category it is. I mean, um, you know, we all get uh, different disabilities as we get older. And I mean, one of my fears that I heard from my neighbor this morning is what would happen in BC if they got a uh, conservative government? I said, don't, you know, don't go there. I said, don't, don't, don't go there because, you know, we, we want a better way of life for Canadians with disabilities and that we'll just go backwards, right? Or if we got the liberal government in, we'd go backwards, right? I mean, we lived through that era, um, you know, for for you know people with disabilities and uh i know that the ndp is fighting um provincially and federally uh to make things better for people um so thank you uh, benita on on um basically coming on today and, well uh, thank you for the invite again i really enjoy the time and i really appreciate all the uh, work you do to reach out and to bring folks together and have these conversations absolutely uh, and i'd love to have you on again very very soon thanks benita Thanks, Benita. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. bye.